thank you all so much for coming. Um, it is so nice to be here in person. I like get so giddy with excitement just seeing actual people in real life in this building. It is just absolutely amazing. So thank you all for coming. Um, so this, I'm just, right, sorry, I've got notes. Um, I haven't done this for a while, so if I'm a bit rusty, just give me a break and I'll get a beer later, then it'll all be fine. So, um, for anyone who doesn't know, I am Becky Chilcott, and I'm delighted to welcome you all here today. Um, it's wonderful to have you all here in person, and we are also streaming online as well. So if you want to give a big cheer and hello and sort of whoop for the online people to make them feel included, that would be great. Fabulous, thank you. I just thought of that and I was like, it's quite cringy in American, but go with it, Becky. Um, so, Becky. thank you. <laughs> Great. So, if you don't know, we are hosting this talk to raise money for the St. Bride Library and all the proceeds from ticket sales will go directly to keeping it running for future generations to enjoy. Um, so, thank you for coming along and supporting us in this way. We really appreciate it, especially in these testing times where it has been quite difficult. So, just by being here, you're keeping this library going, the print workshop going, so it's just absolutely brilliant. Um, so, as we are live streaming this event, please bear with us if we have any technical difficulties with the lecture. If this happens, we will try to rectify it as quickly as possible. For anyone on Zoom, if you are experiencing technical difficulties your end, sometimes logging out and back in again can help, but if you have continued difficulties, <laughs> you'll be able to watch the recording which we will email to you next week. Uh, mute, um, could you mute me on that laptop down there, Nico? Sorry, I could just hear myself out of the corner of my ear on the laptop. Um, it's a bit dis distracting. Anyway, so can our Zoom attendees please make sure that they're all muted? And for our in-person guests, please can you just make sure that your mobile phones are turned off or on silent? Um, what else do I need to say? We don't mind you taking photographs, but um, if any of the speakers don't want you to take photographs or share anything, then I'm hoping that they'll just tell you at the beginning of their talk, but I think it's all fine. So um, do use the hashtag same but different if you would like to share your thoughts, photos, just general enthusiasm or disdain at tonight's event. So we'd love to hear what you think, good or bad. Um, yes, and if you are taking photos, please don't use the flash because it is really distracting. And so for anyone attending in person, we would just like you to make you aware that if the fire alarm goes off this evening, this will be one continuous bell. And the meeting point is in Salisbury Square, which you can access through reception, um, through the doorway, and there's like an archway, and it's like where a monument thing is, like through the archway. So if there's a fire, that's the meeting point. If that way is blocked by a fire, you'll be directed left out of these doors, down some stairs, and out onto the street, and then we'll meet, we'll guide you up around to that way. So hopefully you're prepared if it all goes to shit. So, <laughs> see, someone was asking if there was swearing earlier. There is swearing. <laughs> Um, and we would also like to say a huge thank you to Google and the Wink into Words Society Charitable Trust who've generously sponsored this lecture. Um, the Wink into Words Charitable Trust sponsors students and other people who like, might just be starting in their career to come to events like this, so it's really, really great. Um, so if you are one of those people, an extra special welcome to you. I've got to change my slides, that's what this tells me next. So we've got, always got great events like this going on. They're not all about book design, but they're all absolutely brilliant, just because I organise them, and the speakers are always amazing. So some are a bit more geeky and nerdy, some are a bit different. You might come along to something you've never heard about, but you'll always learn something and be entertained and meet brilliant people, so do come along if you can. I've been coming to these since about 2006, and I've just met some great people, learned some great things, and it's always really brilliant. So our next event is on the 27th of April, which will be online and in person, and Lara Captan will be talking about investigatory... I can't even speak now. Investig <laughs> it's going to happen. It's probably third time lucky. Investigatory explorations in, and experimentations in Arabic type. Um, her work is just incredible, and this is a little snapshot, and she's just meant to be a brilliant speaker, so I'm really excited about hearing her talk. And... If you've not come to one of these before, they are absolutely brilliant. We have our annual Waze Goose, which is happening on the 22nd of May. You can just turn up, no booking needed, and it's basically like a printing, like letterpress heaven. There'll be lots of people selling stuff, selling prints, there'll be demonstrations, there'll be amazing cake on, on sale, which is always brilliant, and for me, the highlight. So if you are free on a sunny, hopefully sunny Sunday in May, come along. We would love to see you there, and you'll probably go away with too many things that you just can't resist but don't really need, but obviously do need. So please come to that. 
And I'm nearly at the end of this, so you know, you'll be happy to hand over to Nico in a minute. Um, if you don't know, we have an amazing library upstairs, which is why we're here to raise money for it and just to hear these brilliant speakers. Um, and the library is open every Wednesday, and we offer three-hour slots from 12 till 3 or 3.30 to 6.30 by appointment only. So please like, email the addresses on here or find out more stuff on our website if you would like to know more about using the library. And then finally, our print workshop is open constantly, and we hold a range of courses for all abilities in our print workshop. And we can also cater for group visits and tailor them for you if that's something you would like to do. So there's an email address here. You can go onto our website or email the events team if you'd like to find out more. I've done a few courses here, and they're brilliant, so I can highly recommend coming along if you can to do one of those. And finally, I would just like to say the biggest of thank yous to tonight's talk curators, Kira Elliott, Nico Taylor, and Jack Smith, who have put so much effort and time into making tonight's talk possible. So please can we have a huge round of applause for them and welcome to the stage. Good evening, book fans. Um, can we knock the lights down? if that's possible, because yes. I feel very exposed. Um, uh, could you pull down that little thing? That little oh, this is... <laughs> <laughs> For those online, we're kind of rigging into the St. Bride's <laughs> electric sort of wiring system. <laughs> I'm very happy with that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, fantastic. Um, I'm Nico Taylor. I'm one of the art directors at Little Brown Book Group. And alongside Kira Elliott and Jack Smith, let's invite you to a very awkwardly titled Same But Different. <laughs> so it's been, I think, three and a bit years since we were last in this room hosting one of our kind of shambles events. Um, and I think it's a pleasure to see you all in person. I think there are 100 people online. Becky, am I right? 110 I think it's very impressive. I think across the country, which I think is testament to the world we live in now, you know, sort of hybrid world. Um, and yeah, I think we're all in for a treat. Um, Becky was overly fawning about our input. We do so little to get this off the ground. Becky is the one that kind of keeps it all together, keeps the wheels spinning. Everything she asks for, we deliver five days late. Everything we ask for is unbelievably awkward. And credit to you, Becky, for kind of keeping us in here and credit to St. Bride for such an amazing establishment. And everybody that bought a ticket, as Becky says, and, you know, goes to support this. No speakers get paid. We don't get paid. You know, we get one free beer, um, full disclaimer. And, you know, every money, kind of every pound that you spend goes to support this amazing establishment. Um, so we started doing these talks in 2017. We started with Killed Covers, which is, you know, a very obvious sort of uh, theme. And we've kind of got more and more obscure throughout the years. And I think we're kind of proud to be part of the book you know, it's a social book design community now. We have, you know, started many years ago with Henry Stedman and Lizzie Gardner's sort of social drinks. We've got John Gray and Jamie Keenan's ABCDs about to hit their 10th year next year. And we're really kind of trying to embrace this idea of like celebrating and debating and shouting about the work we do, whether you are kind of an art director and a children's publisher or you're a freelancer or you're an illustrator, just kind of embracing the world. And that's what we're here to do now. So um, it comes on to tonight's talk, same but different. And essentially the process goes like this. Uh, Jack, Kira and I sit around the table or have a very awkward Zoom call, talk about the themes of publishing we think might be moderately interesting, pick a handful of very talented designers, art directors, illustrators, throw them all together and just say, same but different, do what you want which I think, credit to them, is the most intimidating brief, and as an art director, is the worst brief you could ever get, because we just say, just do what you want, you know, like, no direction, no feedback, there's no sense of us kind of telling people what to do, so credit to them for kind of coming up with what I think are some fantastic talks from the ones I've seen. Um, so really, kind of, they deserve all your support and all your enthusiasm, because it's not easy standing up here talking about work in front of 100 people in the room, 100 people online, so... Give them all your enthusiasm. Um, so, yeah, they're going to be bloody great, I'd say that. Um, and I think we shouldn't mess around. We should get cracking on. 
So, first up, from the back room of Blockbuster, to being the Deputy Art Director at Bloomsbury. He's designed some of the most famous covers of the past couple of years. Three women. He's designed the shit out of George Saunders. Saun um, the Renietto Lodge. How many designers in this room have had a Greg Heinemann brief on their cover comps? And I think it's all of you. He's been shortlisted for Designer of the Year at the Nibbies recently. He's going to be fantastic. It's Mr. Greg Heinemann. <laughs> Thanks for that, Nico. That was really too kind. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Greg Heinemann, and I've spelt it right, so this is going to go okay. Um, so I have quite a selfish rule when it comes to all of this book cover design business in that I generally ignore a great deal of the brief um, and twist the project into something I might actually find interesting. Um, cover design can be really laborious, as we all know, and so I generally want to enjoy every project if I can. Um, transferring that excitement and joy onto a blank rectangle should give the viewer some kind, should be equally infectious and some kind of surprise as well. Um, definitely surprising the cover meeting because it's completely what they haven't asked for. Um, so the truance was a really nice brief, but perhaps a little predictable. They wanted me to whip up a Sally Rooney-esque cover to convey a campus set coming-of-age story with a love triangle and a side order of murder thrown in. Um, but there's only one person in this room who does good Sally Rooney covers, and uh, I'll leave that to them. Um, it's, a, it's a double whiskey, please. <laughs> sure. um, so this project really became an exercise in following your nose and um, being open to new directions. Um, our three main characters um, drive around in an old hearse, which to me was the most interesting detail of the story and not in the brief. Um, and that tiny detail became my way into the project. Um, so frustratingly, the only decent image I could find of a vintage hearse was a tiny product shot of a um, scale model. So I started designing around it anyway, um, basing the cover concept on a scene where the characters drive to a forest bathed in golden light in the aftermath of a murder. And so I illustrated a forest made up of these overly tall, abstracted yellow trees with long golden hour shadows, um, positioning them so that they separate into a kind of clearing and highlighting the hearse that's hiding out. Um, and I've always liked the jarring nature of using photography and illustration together and having this pitch black lump of metal in the middle of this bright natural forest really worked. Um, at this point, I sat happy with the cover and it was now fully approved and everyone in the house loved it and the author loved it. Um, but I still wondered how I could take it further, um, which kind of happens when you've got a 12 month um, span to work on a, on a cover. And so what I also needed to do was get around licensing this tiny JPEG of a toy, and I didn't know how I was going to call up this small toy company. Um, so rule number one of many is never to resort to Google Images. <laughs> um, but in this case, it meant that the project actually changed for the better. So I bought this very expensive tiny car. <laughs> 94... 95, and um, I had it shipped over from the Netherlands with the intention of just photographing it by itself and slotting it in. And um, it turned up, and it was actually amazing in, 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 you know, in the middle of my hands. It was, and the idea of elevating the design into a miniature scene quickly took shape. You know, I had this car that was so detailed and beautiful in real life. Why not take this idea forward and flesh out this world? Um, so I had 300 laser-cut Pantone trees made up. <laughs> this is just one of the layers, by the way. Um, and um, all of differing heights because we had to shoot it from an angle. So we had to kind of account for everything to sort of make up this canopy, canopy at the top. Um, and so I glued metal rods to the back of each tree 
and um, stuck them into layers of foam board, hoping they'd stay up, which frankly took days and was a hot, sticky, high from the fumes mess. Um, I really wouldn't recommend it because um, I had to assemble everything the day after ABCD. And I think we, know, we all know what that's like. Um, and subsequently, I glued my hands to my desk and my Wacom and my mug of tea. Um, so anyway, here's one I made earlier. And um, so we shot it and painstakingly referencing the, the original cover with the lighting and every shadow. And once we had the cover, we sort of then pushed, pushed further. Um, we thought maybe we can get some end papers out of this. So I basically tried to get this, the car driving through this blanket of yellow leaves like a Batmobile and some extra elements that could be used for the, the looming paperback. Um, by flipping the trees around, because obviously they're only printed on one side, but by flipping it, it then became a winter forest. Um, and so, yeah, the final jacket, there's the lovely Kate Weinberg, um, is a hybrid of the shoot and the original art, and um, became like a really decent success for a debut author. Um, a really nice, like, package on the whole and um, a project that stepped out the boundaries of the screen, which for me was the most rewarding part. Um, the author even went away and expanded the forest scene um, in the book into referencing a lot, of, a lot of the imagery that I'd come up with. Um, and at the end of the day, um, I gave all of the leftover trees to our marketing department and they put those in proofs to send out to reviewers, which was a, quite a nice thing. And then um, the hearse, which is sort of the MacGuffin of our story, now sits three doors down from me in Kate Weinberg's kitchen because um, it bizarrely turns out she was my neighbour all along. <laughs> <laughs> and really, really very sweet. Um, so, yeah, that's me. Thank you very much to Jack, Nico, Kira and Becky for inviting me. Thanks. <laughs>
My way of dealing with it is to be a little bit self-indulgent. I'll go and I'll have a look at different fonts, I'll look at different designers, illustrators, colors, anything to try and inspire me. And I'll try and get some of the type, such as the title or the name, quotes, some sort of background color and anything just to fill the void. And just get started. Um, and then I'll take the covers to the cover meeting. And I'll take some more covers to the cover meeting. I think we see where this is going. <laughs> Um, marketing will start asking, where's the cover? We need the cover. Sales will start asking, where's the cover? We need to sell in the cover. It's getting very late now. Um, and you'll just be there going, it's fine, it's fine, it's coming, it's definitely coming. Um, so you'll take some more covers, some more covers, a few more covers, some more covers, <laughs> until eventually, after some discussions, some very heated discussions, um, we end up back kind of where we started but with a little help from some amazing illustrators, thank you, Nathan Burton, um, you can make it look really good. But it's not always like that. Sometimes you get a couple of ladders, and the journey from brief to final cover is a lot easier and a lot smoother. And I find that the briefs that excite me the most and tend to kind of result in those kind of covers uh, generally have these words on, so illustrative or photographic, have a play around, eye-catching, punchy and playful. Um, and those are the ones that tend to inspire me a bit and give me a bit more room to breathe and a bit more room to design. So I'll just end up, that's me by the way, <laughs> in a room surrounded by puppies, which is kind of my preferred state. Um, so I'll end up having an idea, usually just from the brief. So if it has a great title, like this one, um, and it can, we can all relate to it, like this one, um, the journey is a lot shorter. Sometimes the brief is a bit prescriptive, um, such, a, such as the sports personality ones, where it's generally a kind of angry looking man, with a bit of a, or woman, with a, with a bit of a grainy texture on, looking moodily out from a kind of dull background, um, with, with sans serif type kind of looming at you. Unless, of course, you change it up a little bit and make it <laughs> your own thing. Um, sometimes, just through playing with covers that you already think are kind of there, you can actually get to something that's a lot better. Um, for example, Platypus Matters, I was kind of, I'm almost there, this is fine, I can do this. Um, and then I kind of started looking at Australia. And I was thinking, hmm, I wonder. Can I fit the animals into the shape of Australia? I can. <laughs> and so I ended up with that. Um, so I guess the moral of my story um, is, you know, designers like um, snakes and ladders, but you just got to remember to have a bit of fun with it. Thank you. <laughs>
you don't want to hear spoilers and you need to leave, please don't. <laughs> this isn't actually the book. I just felt weird saying it from the top of my head. I thought that was kind of creepy, so this is just a visual aid. <laughs> It's a good book, actually. You know, it's a, a Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, great cover. <laughs> uh, the Vasilenkos dreamed of wild things and wild places and all of the adventures they would have. But October couldn't sleep. He was thinking of the wildest thing of all in the wildest place of all, a monster called the wilderness that lurks outside. Yell October. I don't want to go outside into the wilderness where the wilderness is, where the wilderness lives. The wilderness, uh, the monster called the wilderness. The wilderness isn't a monster. That's just a silly thing that people say, said Dad. I heard it is a monster, said May. She's the redhead at the bottom on the right-hand side corner. <laughs> and I heard it smushes children, eats rocks, rides, motor, rides motorbikes, and maybe it could be my psychic. <laughs> Woofed, said October which was a noise that meant he felt scared, panicky, and a little trepidatious. The wilderness isn't a monster, said Mum. It's a place, a place filled with many stories and adventures. But October just saw a place filled with slimy tails and sharp teeth. Now, about halfway through the book, I realized that making children's books is really stressful, <laughs> and I feel like you might have understood that part. I was completely overwhelmed. Years into the project, I hadn't made much progress. And uh, I spoke to my parents about it, and a conversation with them changed my perspective on the book as a project and just creative projects in general. Uh, I was asking them why they make so many shit movies. They are filmmakers, and they do make some great movies, but the ones that they are fondest of were the shit ones. Uh, they both agreed that after a time working in the film business, uh, they became more excited about the project itself, about making the film. Making the film became the goal and not necessarily how well the film did. And if it did do well, that was a bonus. Um, I took that into working on the book and became completely absorbed in the process, absorbed in uh, the task rather than how well it was going to do at the end. And it changed how I viewed creative projects in general. I had been a little bit obsessed with the outcome and what I was going to get out of the book when it was finished and completed. And I realized that you've heard this kind of advice in some form uh, before, but I feel like it, it warrants repeating. During lockdown, that kind of attitude of being very goal-oriented was suffocating. But once uh, I was able to enjoy the task and have that be the goal, it was like a refuge. Uh, my parents are hippies, but they're correct. Um, <laughs> I'm going to read you a little bit more of the book. Uh, this feels like I got out of doing a talk somehow. But um, uh, when I'm finished, I'll go sit down. And, uh, and afterwards, please come find me and ask me more questions about the book. I'd love to talk about it. Oh, there was more slides. <laughs> View these slides. <laughs> OK. Woofed, said Mum, which was a noise that meant I feel happy, glad, and a little wonderstruck. I can see treasures all the way home, said August. He's the fellow with the blue hat and the, uh, the um, telescope. But October didn't see treasures. He saw a murky mist hiding hideous creatures and 142 things in the wild that leave a very itchy rash. I'll never be brave enough to be an adventurer, he thought. Can't they see that? Now listen, readers. <laughs> listen to readers. Yes, I'm talking to you. Pay close attention. Stick together and keep your wits about you because if we lose each other, we're lost. Turning page for dramatic effect. <laughs> it was at this moment as October tumbled towards a certain death that for some strange reason he remembered it was actually 143 things in the wild that give you a very itchy rash. All of a sudden, and all at once, October was in the wilderness, where the wilderness is, where the wilderness lives, and the wilderness was looking right at him. <laughs> but as the wilderness whooshed into a terrible tornado, October realized something. The wilderness wasn't a monster. They were scared. October knew because October was scared too. So he did something brave. He waved, and to his surprise, 
The wilderness waved back. It's very cute. <laughs> Woofed, said the wilderness, which was a noise that meant I feel happy, a bit scared, and a little wonderstruck. You must be lost, he said. How do you, how do you know, said October. Well, I go where the wind takes me, said the wilderness, and I never know where I'll be, so it takes someone getting lost to find me. I'm trying to find my way home, said October. Well, said the wilderness, maybe you just need to see where you've been from a different point of view. October could see above the clouds, he could see wild places filled with wild things, and in the middle of it all, a house. That's where my home is, where the Vasilenkos live. I can take you there, said the wilderness. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, and can we welcome to the stage Art Director of Ebury, Lulu Clark. Can you just move this down a little bit? <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, yes, so, I'm Lulu, um, and I'm the Art Director of Ebury. Um, and I'm gonna chat to you a little bit tonight um, just about my journey working in the publishing industry for the last 15 years and um, just some sort of similarities and differences that I've sort of discovered along the way. Um, I'm really aware that I've only got seven minutes to talk and I've got quite a lot to do, so I will dive straight in. Um, so yeah, I started my career um, as a junior designer at um, Orion. Um, and yeah, I was surrounded by an art team of about 12 really inspiring creatives and just all round lovely humans. Um, and I was showing the ropes basically of, of um, kind of dipping my toe into just all genres, which at the time was, was sort of quite unusual. I, I noticed that designers that had been, been there a lot longer than me kind of had their thing and, and I was just sort of trying everything. So that was, that was really beneficial to do. Um, then, as, as time sort of went on, I sort of found my groove um, and realised it was kind of in the non-fiction um, space, and particularly cookery and, and full-colour illustrated books. That's sort of what I was mainly attracted to. Um, so, yeah, I, I suddenly shifted from just doing book cover designs to suddenly um, sort of trying my hand at a bit of art direction and, um, and full book design, which, which was cool. Here's a few uh, that I worked on when I was there. Um, but yeah, I just, I just found it really energising and exciting to see um, how the teamwork behind these large projects, um, they were just so essential to the outcome. And, and with the right talent and um, the right expertise in place, you, you're kind of halfway there to creating something really exciting. Um, so that was, that was kind of cool to explore that. Um, and some more. Um, so yeah, so after um, 12 years at Orion, it was, it was sort of time for me to change it up a bit. And um, I, knew, I knew this sort of non-fiction area was, was where I wanted to be. So that's how I ended up at Ebury. Um, of course, there's loads of great non-fiction publishers out there. But Ebury, for some reason, had just sort of been on my radar and, and, and some examples of the books they were publishing and the authors that were just sort of ones that I really admired. So I kind of got thinking, oh, maybe, maybe that would kind of be a good place to go next. Um, but as I was sort of trying to find out a bit about it, I, I just unusually couldn't find anything about their art department there. And then, as it turned out, because they didn't have one, um, it just didn't exist, which was like, mind blown. Like, how, how, how did they work? So um, yeah, I got in touch, and, and um, it, it kind of piqued my interest, and, and I got chatting to the MD and the publisher and then yeah like kind of after a lot of discussions and coffees and a bit of strategizing we, we kind of realized that this was a really good timing for both of us to try something new and and so yeah in in 2020 I became Ebris first ever art director and then about a week later Covid hit and it wasn't it wasn't great timing but it was it was fine um, yes yeah, so here's a few more Ebris books so yeah, just to give you a bit of context, how Ebury is is you know same but different. It, it does work in a slightly different way. Um, so it is split into like four key hubs. So um, I will take you through through all of these. But basically, each, each hub runs as its sort of little mini 
own individual publisher, um, with each having its, its kind of collection of um, imprints and its own specialist team of um, publicity, marketing and editorial that are kind of um, expert in that area. Um, so here, just take you through what each of them do and give you a little, a little um, look at some of the covers that we've done in the last year. Um, so the Smart Hub, this is all history, politics, popular science, current affair titles. Um, entertainment, there's lots of memoir, humour, sport, poetry, crime, um, all of that jazz. Um, Self-hub, this is lots of personal development, psychology, diet, fitness, um, health, mindfulness. Here's some lovely covers from that hub. And then we've got lifestyle, which is the fourth hub, and it's quite a big one because this includes our BBC um, book titles, our, our sort of brand partnership titles too, um, and these sort of focus quite a lot on cookbooks, wellbeing, um, lifestyle guides, and, and lots of gift books. So that is the range. Um, so <clears throat> as, as art director of Ebre, I oversee all of that. And then a question I get asked quite a lot is, is sort of how can little old me just sort of like manage that amount of um, titles on my own? And on, honestly, the only way I can do it is just to sort of surround myself with um, a great support unit, um, which, yes, I get in-house. Like, the, um, the culture of Ebre is lovely. It's really collaborative. Everyone's really um, respectful and, and supportive of each, each other's roles. Um, and, and I sort of benefited from the hangover of before I was there, all of the editors, they were, they were art directors for their own books as well. So um, they're kind of super focused in on book jackets and um, they really prioritise and appreciate the, um, the cover art. So, so that's a real bonus. But more importantly, um, my support comes externally from freelancers. And I know loads of you here. Um, for sort of speed and efficiency, it's essential. I work with designers who I really trust and admire their work and, and yeah, like 100% trust that they're going to deliver. No pressure. Um, <laughs> and, um, and creative success, for me, it's kind of about just um, ever increasing our, our pool of, of talent, basically, and, and just making sure it's as diverse as possible. Um, on that, I mean, I, I'm aware diversity is a real, sort of become a bit of a buzzword now, but I can absolutely say with authenticity that um, from our standpoint, it's, it's crucial um, to have this range of designers that can work on such a huge range of books that, that we work on. I mean, you all approach things in such different ways, you know, we've all got different brains, we've all lived different experiences, and that all kind of feeds into um, are different perspectives and, and result in different solutions to answering briefs. So, you know, nail that and, and we'll constantly be creating really exciting artwork and book covers that have impact and, and sort of stand a better chance of getting into the hands of like wider, broader readership, which ultimately that's what it's all about, isn't it? Um, so a really good example of this actually is um, the annual Penguin Design Competition. Um, that I was on the judging panel for last year and we're doing the one this year. Um, yeah, so, so this is just a good example of one brief. This was last year's uh, fiction category. Um, 428 entries, 428 different designs. Um, even like the similar concepts were just, you know, executed so differently, different illustration styles, you know, like different colourways. Everyone sort of brought their own thing to it. And I, I just think that's a really good example of, you know, the, all these entries. I mean, it was, it was a worldwide competition and people of all different walks of life entering. And, yeah, it was, it was just really cool to see, like, the, the difference and, um, yeah, different perspectives, I guess. Um, so... Finally, I just want to say all of the covers that I've shared today, they've all been designed by our freelancers. Um, loads of you are here. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. You're all awesome. And as, as you now know, I genuinely couldn't do this without you all. Um, so, yeah, yeah, thank you all. Um, and I'll just leave you this sort of little thought. It, no two of you are the same. 
You each approach design from your own unique perspectives, and this difference is your superpower. Thank you all. Okay, folks. I hope everyone had a nice intermission. Um, I'd like to once again thank all of our brilliant speakers from uh, the first half. It's not a football match. But uh, I'd also like to say hello to... Uh, Becky just read out a list of the many, many countries who are tuning in from around the world. So this is a, a, a global St. Bride's uh, uh, same but different talk. So I'd like to say a quick hello to all of our international global viewers. Um, and I would like to also welcome to the stage uh, last year's Designer of the Year. Uh, that's right. Uh, Art Director at Simon Schuster Children's UK, Jane Buckley. But anyway, hello, I'm Jane Buckley, nice to meet you all. Um, Henry, I think I love you. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to be your friend. <laughs> so, picture book designers, what do we do? Um, let's start working this out. So, basically, picture book design. I mean, the best way to describe it, I think, is let's think of the cinema. We don't just, just design the posters, we de design the entire thing. So we basically become, I suppose, like Steven Spielberg, maybe. <laughs> um, we work really closely with the editorial team. Um, you need a really creative editor to work with you, HMS, there you go. And um, yeah, so we work really, really closely from the beginning. We don't, I don't work to briefs, they're rock and roll. Um, <laughs> we work literally from reading the text. That's where the design starts. Let me move on. So, starting with I'm Sticking With You. This was an amazing book to work on. Fantastic te text from the beginning. Um, a dream text, as we call it. Um, and before we'd even got to that stage, um, finding this fantastic illustrator, um, where do we find them? I mean, I get that, asked that question quite a lot. Um, from, you know, postcards, greeting cards, to Steve Small, who um, I was actually at home in Bradford with my mother watching Coronation Street. <laughs> Um, so thank you, Valerie. Um, and this amazing advert came on, TSB. Uh, and um, yeah, and I just, just got intrigued by this illustration. I thought, wow, this has got some connection. This has got something. This is definitely a picture book artist in the making. And I watched and watched. And I thought, who is this person? And I sort of researched and researched. And it took me quite a while to track him down. He's quite elusive, um, Mr. Small. And, um, yeah, and eventually um, tracked him down. And, yeah, and he was well up for it. And, you know, they come in any shape or form, illustrations that we get, you know, they, we, we see little things on post-it notes, cards. I'll scan them in and work from the... Oh, sorry. Sorry if I'm bellowing out there in my northern accent. Um, we, see, we, we will take anything, post-it notes, cards, sketchbooks. I'll scan them in. We'll work with them from the start. We're creating... You know, the design starts literally as soon as we see that image. Before we've even created a rectangle square document, we've already started our thought process. How is the book going to look? Alongside with the editor, we're conjuring up ideas already. Um, in the case of Steve Small, there are so many different illustrations. At this stage, I'm thinking, type, what typography do I want to use? What's the title going to be like? Um, picture book design, we work with the entire book, so we have to think of the whole thing. I was thinking about fonts. Hmm, what would Bear think? What would Bear want? You know, what would Bear use? And starting looking at Steve's sketch style as well. It's a bit scratchy. Do I want to incorporate that? And so the journey sort of starts with it. We work with the sketches, like I said, from post-it notes to whatever. And, and Steve, being the genius he is, will start with line work. Then suddenly he'll introduce a bit of colour. We get sales as well, say, don't go too brown, which we don't. <laughs> so therefore, we think of... Oh, OK, how can we keep the brown but have some lovely complementary colours working alongside it? Hence the blue here. So, moving on to laying to page to text. Picture book designers out there, is there any? Is yes. there any? Yeah! Woo! Love you. Um, yeah. So, basically, we lay text to page. And this comes in a Word doc or an email, however form. So, we have to think with the editor how we're going to lay this to page. And it's manipulation, really. I mean, my audience is three to five. I mean, they are the most critical audience. Anybody who's read a book to a child, I mean, come on. As soon as they lose interest, you've lost your audience, and that's it. And you try to get them back, nah, they're not interested. But you can manipulate that with how you lay it to page. 
For example, a scene like here, I'm showing you the pencil sketch. This, this will have gone as a blank document to the illustrator. And then next, he'll be working on the colour as well. You can see how the sort of changes work with what... With, there's a lot of discussions with the artist on, you know, to in and frame where the text works, what images are going to go in there and what we want and what we don't want. Um, so there are always subtle changes, but for example, on this spread, it was all about building the pace. There's a lot of intricate little illustrations in there, and then suddenly, page turn, it's a breath of fresh air. You slow that pace down, it's manipulation, yes, I know, but it's what you want. You want us to pause, but it's called the pause moment. So moving on, got another series there. In this book, we were playing with fonts. Now, we can't get too crazy. We just can't. We're working with three to five year olds, but we can play with it a little bit. And in this book, I particularly wanted the voices of both characters to come through. And we spoke about Helen and I about how we were going to get to that point. We played with different fonts, not too extreme, because you can't have two different fonts that don't marry together because you just, again, the children learn to read, even reluctant readers, we know them, they just don't want to read it. So this one had to complement each other as well as complementing the art. And I think, I think, well, I think it did well did well and there you go this is another page turn there and that was the cover how pretty much stayed the same from the beginning actually apart from obviously playing with a different type let me move on sorry I've lost track I've just babbled away without even looking at my cards <laughs> so talking so through this presentation I'm showing you three different art styles all very different all doing the same thing connecting with the audience and that's key that is key also there you go. I've got to put a picture of Doug in there, I think. But anyway, as uh, picture book um, designers as well, I mean, I don't want to get into the te technicalities, but we do have to work a lot with colour. We do have to understand co colour and how it works on the page and how it works on the paper. Uncoated papers, coated papers, every artist is different. Every artist has different colours, shades that work differently on different papers, and we have to be really, really considerate of that because um, the book will just look crap. Sorry, swearing, but yes. <laughs> Again, this one shows a lovely page turn. No, it's the bump of a hump of a camel called Claire. This was a beautiful text design. It was so rhythmic. It was so musical. If anybody, you know, as a designer, I think as a picture book designer, you have to have a sort of sense of musicality within it because this one was just beautiful. And your page turns, your line breaks, everything had to come together. And I just, I just thought this was a dream book to design. And then... Finally, the snow line, which is gorgeous, beautiful, illustrated by Richard Jones, who is an amazing, amazing illustrator who I love working with. Um, let me move on through my cards. Da, 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 da. Um, yeah, excuse me. But yeah, so Richard Jones's book, The Snow Line, a very tricky sort of design work to, in colour sense of this because you've got a white line printed on white paper. It had to be really, we had to be really sensitive with it. We had to really, really read the text, understand who is Caro, who is this little character, who's going to fall in love with this little character. We always like to accessorise, love a little bobble hat. <laughs> there you go, we've got the lion. Now, the lion, who did start off looking a little bit like Jesus Christ, <laughs> and then sort of moved on into Barry Gibb from the Bee Gees. So, um, yeah, we, we, we worked with that. We worked with that. Um, eventually, if Jesus, Barry Gibb had a baby, this is the snow lion. So again, you can see how the text was sent to him and how the illustration came in. When I talk about colour, this is probably one of the most difficult books in the sense of getting the colour right. White line on white paper, and this shows that prime example of that. Visibility in this scene, he was disappearing into the background. So we had to make it clear you could see him, you couldn't see him. And we went through many, many different proof stages just to get that colour right, taking out the cyan, taking out the magenta, bringing the magenta back in, just to get the right level of where we wanted it to be. And there you go, the three covers that we did in the end. Nice landscape portrait, uh, nice landscape format, um, working with a little girl, all gorgeous, but the one that we went for was the top one. And a slight angle of the head, just by 10%, and we think we got that right. So I hope you enjoyed that. Seven minutes, maybe a little bit longer, maybe not, of how to be a picture book designer. Thank you for listening and thank you for inviting me. Thank you very much, Jane. And can we please welcome to the stage from Vintage at Penguin Random House, Kishan Rajani. Thank you, Jack. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, 
So I hope you're all enjoying the talk. Um, so this evening, I kind of want to take a slightly different turn from what we've been looking at and um, focus on kind of how the, we can... Um, sorry, I'm, I'm stopping up. Um, I want to look at how the process of designing for authors of colour has changed in the past couple of years. Um, so for a little bit of context, publishing has and is continually changing as a result of, uh, as a result of the Black Lives Matter movement, um, in part benefiting from a growing list of diverse authors. Um, and in turn, there's also been a lot of introspection in our art departments for how we can design and cater for authors of colour. Um, so there's like a, been a real desire to push past stereotypes um, and familiar tropes that we've previously lent on and make an effort to, to design instead with a greater sympathy and curiosity for different cultures and art forms. Um, so at Vintage, um, we've kind of been trying to look at how we can achieve this through an active effort to explore um, different uh, diverse artists uh, from marginalised communities that have been previously excluded from this space. Um, so we found visits to galleries to be really fruitful, um, like the Life Between Islands exhibition at the Tate. Um, we went to see Zanel Mahuli's exhibition, um, and then that of uh, Ljubljana Hibid recently, which has been kind of incredible. Um, we've also really enjoyed kind of scrolling away um, some artists and illustrators that we found um, on a departmental Instagram and Pinterest board. Um, and then our lovely picture researcher, Lily, um, has been collecting some more photography and art books for us to explore, um, as well as expanding our relationship with uh, picture libraries. Um, we've also been uh, engaging in some brilliant resources like the Designers of Colour Instagram account by Ebby, I don't know where, you, there you are, uh, who's here somewhere, um, I think I see you in the middle. Um, and that's been kind of really, really useful for us to find um, some new and diverse uh, artists to work with. Um, so for this talk, I kind of really wanted to showcase uh, some of the ways that I've really enjoyed working on a couple of different projects by authors of colour. Um, and so I want to look at Ben Okri and exploring artists for that cover. Um, Africa's not a country. I was looking at different typographers. Um, and then for hidden history, I was looking at um, historical uh, artefacts uh, that kind of helped define that book cover. Um, so kind of jumping into the Ben Okri series, um, we are looking at um, or following the story of uh, our protagonist, uh, Azaro, who's a spirit child who kind of inhibits both the world of the spirits and that of the living. Um, so for that, I kind of started to look at some kind of really brilliant um, artists that I'd come across on Pinterest. Um, so here's uh, uh, one of the artists I found is uh, Johnson Ezefula. Um, and I really liked the, the kind of line that he tread between um, realism and surrealism in his artwork that felt really right for this book. Um, and I've left all of their Instagram ads on the side in case someone wants to work with them uh, in the future. Um, and then there's also the work of Tosin, who I found this kind of really colourful graphic painting style to be really engaging and the emotional impact that he creates through uh, eye contact of his subject matter. Um, and then we have, finally, the work of uh, Derek Officer Boateng, who's kind of brilliantly capturing that sense of surrealism and childlike magic that I, so, I really strongly associate with the character of, of Azaro. Um, so here's a couple of the visuals that I'd mocked up, um, highlighting the artist's work. Um, and as much as I'd kind of fallen in love with all of these artists, um, as we've kind of found out in these talks, things don't always go according to plan. Um, so the, the author, when ha having looked at those previous artists, kind of really wanted to focus and had his own ideas and, and opinions that he wanted his covers to go down. And he was really focused on this idea of uh, visual paradoxes um, so, kind of being pushed for time, these are some of the illustrations that I created for, for the covers, uh, kind of being inspired by uh, Escher's Knot, which is uh, one of the, the references that the author kind of had come up with. Um, and that finally kind of led to um, the final iterations of the cover, and I kind of used this idea of a, a circle, a triangle, and a square, uh, and an infinite ripple to get this idea of a visual paradox, and then highlighting some like, visual narrative through the cutout. Um, and um, although I wasn't able to work with those uh, artists that I'd showcased uh, earlier, I think it was really invaluable to be able to come across their work, and I feel really determined to see if I can find home for them on a cover in the future. Um, or maybe one of you guys will. 
Um, and then jumping straight into Africa's Not a Country, uh, which is a non-fiction title that looks into debunking a lot of stereotypes about the continent and the countries that inhabit it. Um, as someone who, um, uh, I don't know, maybe it's just me, but as a designer, I sometimes fall into the habit of using typefaces that I feel really comfortable with on, on projects. So for this uh, title, I really wanted to kind of step out of my comfort zone and see if I can work with and kind of champion the works uh, of uh, black and brown typographers um, to kind of kick off the design process for this. So here are some of the typographers that I'd come across um, who are kind of all brilliant in their own right. Um, and uh, Osman Schumer, um, which is the third one down, kind of has this really fantastic story behind his typeface, which is called Colonial Bastard Roads, which kind of looks at the influence of colonialism in South Africa. Um, but the one kind of typographer that I want to focus on for this talk had a, a real influence on uh, this project uh, was Trey Seals, um, and his uh, so he's a, a French typographer, um, and he's created his own type uh, foundry called Vocal Type, um, which everyone should definitely go and check out if you haven't already. Um, and it's on there that I kind of fell in love with his typeface called Martin. Um, so Martin is a, a non-violent typeface inspired by the remnants of the Memphis sanitation strike of 1968. Um, so the strike originally um, sought out to improve the working conditions of the many black and brown uh, trash handlers after two men were tragically killed by a mal malfunctioning uh, garbage truck. Um, and Martin Luther King, uh, who joined this movement, which later evolved to kind of better the lives of the wider black commun community, uh, was later, later assassinated uh, and 20,000 people took to the streets in un union of this collective course with placards utilising this typeface reading on a king and racism. So this is the kind of cover that I uh, came up with that I wanted to use kind of, um, kind of celebrating this typeface which has a really strong history um, of protest and pushback against uh, racial injustices and then also kind of giving focus to the many independent nations that make up this continent highlighted by a use of non-stereotypical African colours. Uh, and then jumping straight into hidden heritage. Um, I, for this one, I kind of want to look at a historical touch point uh, that ended up with um, defining the cover design for this book. Um, so we were trialling a, a lot of different cover designs for this, um, and a lot of them had legs, but um, in kind of conversation with the editor, uh, we kind of both found ourselves falling in love with this uh, character called uh, Tipu Sultan, who's depicted in chapter three of the book. Um, so Tipu Sultan, um, otherwise known as the Tiger of Mesur, uh, is one of the last remaining pillars, uh, was re one of the last remaining pillars of resistance against the British East India Company and their endeavor endeavors to occupy South India. Um, so inspired by his fierce resistance, many possessions were created in his honor, including tiger-hilted swords, thrones, as well as the, the wooden sculpture that you see on the top of the screen there um, of a, a tiger besting in a British soldier. Um, and the almost life-size sculpture conceals a hand-cranked pipe organ inside of it, um, which, when played, produces a harmonic sounds that are meant to emulate the soldier's cry, which is quite graphic and violent, but <laughs> also really beautiful, I don't know. <laughs> um, so there's also a, a really brilliant uh, podcast called uh, Stuff the British Stole, which kind of focuses each episode on a specific artefact, and uh, this is one of the episodes, so if you guys fancy looking that, that up, um, you can do. Um, and this piece is currently being exhibited at the v &A. Um So kind of being inspired by his narrative, uh, I created this rough illustration, uh, kind of highlighting and spotlighting all the many tiger-related possessions of Tipu Sultan, um, and then was later fortunate enough to um, work with artist Namrita Kumar, um, who's a kind of brilliant illustrator in India, to help bring this cover to life. And I think she's obviously done an incredible job. Um, I, that's basically my talk, but I kind of just wanted to leave with one final quote that kind of really spark this whole uh, idea for me and the way in which I uh, uh, kind of process and uh, navigate working with uh, artists of colour and working on books by authors of colour. Um, so this is a quote that I came across on a podcast called the Brown History Podcast. Um, and it was an episode featuring uh, author Nika Shukla, 
Uh, and in conversation with the host, uh, Nikesh was talking about what it means to be a person of color in the creative industry and the responsibilities and, and opportunities the platform holds for him, uh, which really helped to shape my mindset. Um, so the quote goes, so when you're a person of color in the arts in the West, you have to make a choice. At some point, if you're lucky, a white person might open the door and invite you in and you can either close, go in, close the door behind you, you can go in, leave the door open and walk away, or you can go in, jam the foot in the door, get a megaphone out, and start inviting other people in. And in an industry that can often feel very insular, um, this really got me thinking that we as designers are in a huge place of privilege to be able to celebrate and promote the works of artists from all walks of life. And in our small way, uh, through the work that we produce, or, the, or the, those that we champion, uh, have the ability to turn the tide of representation in our industry and in society. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kish. Um, can we please welcome to the stage uh, both fr freelance and also in house at Pan Mac, so uh, double threat, uh, Amy Smithson. Thank you. Hi, St. Brides. Thank you very much for inviting me to this design speed dating event. Um, I'm, um, I'm Amy Smithson, and I've worked over the years for HarperCollins and Penguin and Headline, um, and I've run my own freelance company for over a decade, and I now have split my time between uh, that and Pan Macmillan. And I'm going to chat about briefing and my process and dealing with some of the same covers that appear on briefs a lot of the time. Um, so everyone here will have had briefs with exactly the same cover comps on them, and they can undoubtedly be really helpful, but also just really exasperating as they just begin to constrain your thought process right from the beginning. Um, I do really love all these book covers, by the way, um, but sometimes they're really hard to unsee once you've seen them. Um, but they might be shorthand for what many editors, for some reason, have trouble expressing fully. <laughs> so... Sales, like it's an editor's job to talk up their book and I always just take this with a massive pinch of salt. I just think you can only do what you can do and I think it really pays to remember that you're part of a much bigger and collaborative publishing, pro publishing process. So I'm just saying maybe nod to it but just then ignore it. Um, and then it's a comp for marketing and writing and not design and I've frequently been derailed when I haven't actually asked this really simple question. And then the gnarly one, they want you to mimic it. And this is really hard because I'm sure every designer here finds this quite uncomfortable. And annoyingly, there can be profit in copycat cover sales. Uh, but to me, it's just not that ethical. It's not inspiring. Oop. Oop. There you go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, it's not inspiring. Um, and also, it, I just think it belittles the talent of your design team. Um, and then also, it's shorthand for just the zeitgeist, for tone and mood. And this is so often what they mean. It's just that editors sometimes only have words for writing and not design. It's hard for them. And then they, they really do want the next Sally Rooney like. And this is more challenging. And at this point, I get, try and get a good fee, a good brief, time. And I emphasise that there are many roads to Rooney. So what works for me, and it's a, it's a two-pronged attack, there's rarely just one direct route for a brief. There are lots of variables, and that's probably especially true between fiction and non-fiction. And I've identified, scientifically in a lab, two very <laughs> loose ways of working, and a lot might depend on the brief and the content, the editor and the author and the designer. The rational. <laughs> I'm personifying this using Master of Harm, Professor Chris Whitty. What would Chris do? He'd plan his time skillfully, Research the author marketing competition. He'd read the brief and absorb it. He'd ask pertinent questions, sketch it out, commission thoughtfully, allowing plenty of time, do some serious font analysis, don't divert from the brief, plot your rough ideas, execute those ideas well, deliver on time, show your visuals with confidence, flair and panache in a meeting inspiring instant approval with no alterations. <laughs> and I'm sure you've all been there. <laughs> Approach to <laughs> is the feral. 
wild man of rock, free thinker, and standing stone hugger, Julian Cope might personify the next way of working. And I'm really sorry if you were born in the, after the 80s and I've now alienated half the room. <laughs> um, this might begin with a healthy rant, moving on to the pub, tears, nocturnal waking, but also a lot of enthusiasm. Put loads of things on the page, take things off the page, look obsessively at the competition, look away from the competition, don't do what's on the brief, do the thing you want because that is the thing that comes from you. Uh, displacement activities, lots of these. My favourites are Wordle, lunch and holidays. <laughs> uh, and wait for the deadline to be breathing down your neck and then produced fear-driven work. Um, and the bong is a metaphor and not an instruction. <laughs> so my, just, my kind of example is um, the new book for Emma Donoghue, which... Um, so she's written really vastly different books every time and I did Pull of the Stars, I didn't do the one doing Room um, and you can see the American edition here also at the bottom um, and Hamlet was put on the cover comp for me um, and this book is epic in its reach and scale and massively well researched as was Pull of the Stars um, and my brief was um, like Pull of the Stars but different in fact um, which was, is actually really really hard when the subject matter is so different um, it said, show the essence of the novel, but didn't say what that was. Um, <laughs> be decorative or graphic, but not overly so. And actually, I think I found Hamlet a useful comp in this case because I think it's got a light and elegant touch and it's quite timeless. Um, and that just means you don't have to deal with every aspect of the content, which might not at first glance be crowd please, as it's, um, there's a sort of brevity in the cover design that I think works in its favour. Um, and that book does look at grief and history and some pretty dark family relationships. So, I read it, and to me it was about all of these things, um, and I took away everything you see here. Um, and the book narrative is based on three medieval monks in a coracle, an epic voyage, and they go to an island, and it's really tough, and they illuminate scriptures, and they barely survive. Now, I don't think that's going to light everyone's touch paper at first glance, so I think you have to tread carefully. But it's detailed and fascinating and epic, but there's too much to convey. So, I just basically whittled it down. And I, I decided for myself what I thought would be the best things to try and show. Um, and then there was an, quite an intense period of research. Uh, monks and boats and Christianity. I think this was one of the most research-heavy jobs that I actually ever did. Um, birds. Just a massive amount of birds. And whereas the birds on Pull of the Stars were actually... They featured in the book, but briefly, they were kind of a metaphor. But the books, the birds here are just hugely important. Um, so I thought I could like, definitely bring birds along for the ride. And then Skellig Island, which is the location that the monks arrive in. And it's fantastic. It sort of feels really mythical. And it's a real island. Um, and I'd stared at this from the Irish mainland on a trip. And it looks fearsome and hostile impenetrable, hazardous, and as if it just can't support any form of human life. And it's very easy to become obsessed with. Um, and real monk bones are buried here, and they're all thin and malnourished, and it was also used in the Star Wars films. So Skellig was like, definitely coming along for the ride as well. And then this was me, like, and I just <laughs> I wrestled with more images and like, went down more Skellig wormholes, and I began to feel like Richard Dreyfus and his obsessed character in Close Encounters, <laughs> crazily modelling something that obsessively fills his mind. And if I'd been able to make a model in my living room, I would have, but I didn't. But I do have hundreds of pictures of Skellig Michael on my hard drive, and one in my wallet. <laughs> and then finally, you need a sense of the divine for this book. Um, so something involving a sign, something to indicate that Skellig was the place. Um, and sometimes a nice clichéd light shaft is the only thing for the job. And then I did some pretty amazing sketches. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm still finding them in my notebooks six months further on, but they all look like this, actually. Um, and then finally, that's the, that's the cover. So it's a kind of hybrid of, I don't know, what I hope might look epic and spiritual with the birds, and same, same, but different, but honouring the themes of the book. Um, and you can find this quality item in a bookshop near you in May. Um, and the dull mustard colour is gold foil. And if I had a fiver for every time I've said that in the cover meeting, <laughs> <laughs> or maybe a tenner, given current inflationary pressures. And then just thought I'd just, you know, just to prove my theory, 
I've gone back to the lab and analysed the input on this one. And uh, the heavy research aspect has skewed it to the Chris Whitty rational side, but there are some, definitely some feral elements in there. And if there's a takeaway from the brief we were given for tonight, I'd say it's impossible not to overstate the need to drive your own work forward and find your own unique resolution on a brief and just rub your own design DNA all over it. And I'm going to conclude with a happy illustration of this. I was walking in Battersea Park with mates and we stopped to look at the lemurs who were all playing in their enclosure and they were leaping about and climbing on ropes. And then suddenly one of them anchored the rope between its fluffy buttocks <laughs> and began rubbing proper flossing, as my friend accurately observed. <laughs> so to conclude, we should all be rubbing our own designery fluffy buttocks over every brief we get. <laughs> Thank you very much, Amy, uh, especially for that last slide. It's, it's a real thinker. Um, can we please uh, welcome to the stage uh, free, uh, designer extraordinaire, David Pearson. Thanks, everyone. <clears throat> OK, right. We're away. Um, I haven't drawn graphs since I was very young, in fact, and I started again this morning. Um, I apologise for the quality, but hopefully they'll get some kind of point across. So this hopefully will work. We'll see, won't we? Um, so this, this, is, this is excitement when you begin a new job. And the little dip there is the moment you learn that it's a tray paperback. <laughs> the, most, <laughs> the most disingenuous of, of paperback formats. Um, what's next? OK, oh, this is a good... I've always kept hold of this one. You know the way you kind of grab things... Uh, from the internet, and it's always felt so appropriate for what we do. So, <laughs> in so many ways, in fact. Um, it, it's enduring. Um, I know it's been on my computer for years. I've moved from computer to computer uh, because it, I, I'm so happy to see it and reassured by it. Um, and it, it, you know, it sort of leads into this next fantastic graph. <laughs> um, so, this is, this is uh, I'm sure you've all got these, where um, you get. You, it's a new client, um, or it might be you that's giving the job out, actually, because I've been on both sides of this. And um, it's a free brief. It's like, we want to do something different here. You know, let's, let's take off the shackles. Um, and that, that midway point is the exact moment you deliver those visuals, and they decide that they didn't really want to be that different at all. There's going to be a lot of hands-on involvement from this point onwards. You may or may not be involved. Um, so that's... <laughs> That's when it kind of moves up towards the top. But I, I, I can sympathise from both directions on, on that one. I do, I, you know, I've been... There's a very specific feeling you get in your gut when you commission somebody. And because you don't want to kind of stink out the atmosphere, you, you kind of go, oh, just do what you do. I love you, man. Let's do it. Or, or, or woman. Um, and, it's, <laughs> and it's like, you know, it comes back and it's just this, oh, that was so wrong and I could have avoided it by actually directing better. Um, it's a very specific feeling. Uh, this, oh, we've all, well, I'm sure a lot of you have, have been on the wrong end of one of these. So, you know, a wonderful piece of lettering, um, uh, spelling out the, the author name. You know, this, this is something that could have been pre-agreed. Uh, I've seen lots of these. I've, I'm quite glad to have picked an old version because it kind of removes a lot of potential embarrassment. But you know that that... Um, the actual spelt out typographic version of the name was probably added retrospectively because it wasn't quite legible enough. You could fill a book full of these. You see them all over the place. Um, I was talking, I share a studio with um, a, a magazine team at the moment and we talk a lot about the differences between book design and magazine design. And I, I've kind of convinced myself of this truth that, well, you know, I've been reassure, uh, reassuring myself by it for years and I sort of said it out loud in the studio. And um, I, it, it was this. I always thought that I, uh, publishing design speed was this blue line. I always said that I was reassured by the speed of our industry. It was my speed. You could work, uh, pour over detail you know, in your own time. You could, you could kind of relax your way into it. And I said this out loud, you know, thinking that this is what these magazine guys do in red. You know, they, they work very quickly and sporadically in these very fixed periods. And um, it was pointed out to me that actually 
their experience of book design was more like this, where it was actually a series of really badly coordinated sprints <laughs> all the way through the process. And actually, magazine design, by comparison, was much more structured and uh, relaxing. And it just blew my mind. Um, and I, I kind of believe that that's true as well. I'm not sure about you all. Uh, and talking about speed and time, like something, this, this haunts me forever. Um, the, you know, that kind of like rush to the, the line to get the first visual out. Um, you know, there's a certain level of haste involved, um, you know, to get those thoughts and ideas out of your head. And then you circulate them. There's usually a spread, so they're all quite refined and crude. Um, and then, you know, you might get the go-ahead on one of those designs, and then you may have a several-month uh, period where you get to ref refine, or in, or in my case, piss around with that visual. And, and what I always will do is, like, is like wring the energy out of it. Um, I, I mean, I, I'm happy with the final cover, but there's definitely a loss of kind of uh, tension and, and movement and energy, and I do it every single time, and I, I can't not do it. I can't, I'd, I'd need to be moved away from a computer and have my hands tied in order to do so, but it, it, it haunts me forever. Um, anyway, <laughs> a bit dark. I think it might get, it might get darker as well. Um, this is... Um, a, you know, a John Self quote for, for, I pulled off uh, Twitter relatively recently, and I thought it was good because it, it just shows you how, f how far we've gone as an industry down this route where, um, you know, all of the language is really dialed up to the point where it almost doesn't mean that much. It's such a blanket kind of level of enthusiasm that actually it kind of glances off you a little bit, I think. Um, whereas a good story actually starts to mean something again, you know, if you work in the other direction. Um, and I, I remember, I read, I don't know if you can see it actually, but this is a beer mat, and I was really struck by the use of Truman's claim to make good beer, rather than wonderful or fantastic or whatever beer. And it just really, I just thought that, that's, that's incredible. It just, it seems so truthful as a result. It seems to speak to me with, with very clear language. Um, and also, I just love this, the movement of this, kind of Truman's Ben Truman, Truman's True Brown, Truman's like, uh, like I just love that. I mean, love, most people think I ripped off the Galantz covers for this series of books, but it, I, no, it was a beer mat. I'm a, <laughs> <laughs> exactly the same idea. So it's kind of, it's changing up the language. It's trying to um, replace common day language, which is really, really, it feels really unnotable and making it noteworthy by putting old-style language in. So it almost trips up the eye. So the idea is if you're, you're in a bookshop and there's sort of relentless use of particular words and hopefully you'll trip over something that feels out of place. You know, the word kaleidoscope really isn't used anymore. And scenes of sustained action, I'm not really sure you, you kind of say that. And it made it a really fun project to go back to the writer, Nick, Nick Asbury. Uh, I've never worked with a writer before as a, a cover designer. It was a real thrill and asking him to overwrite, which is the opposite of, I think, what we, what we normally do. We're, we're always trying to boil down and kind of reduce. And I think we've really, we only think that good design is reductive design. And, and I think, you know, if all of the bookshop looks like that, then you can afford to kind of kick against it a little bit. Um, and just, you know, play with form in that way, you know. Um, you put odd little kind of moments in there which might snag the eye, but um, anyway, sorry. They weren't very well received, not by this group of arseholes. <laughs> um, so uh, I should have like hidden, hidden their identities, shouldn't I, really? Uh, but no. Anyway, good luck doing that on PowerPoint, you twat. <laughs> um, these are all, these are all um, letters, or lettering styles that have been rejected because they look like cowboy fonts. <laughs> Um, <laughs> it is dark, this one, isn't it? <laughs> I've been locked up for too long. Um, free oh, this, no, this, this, this perks things up a bit. Uh, there's, there's no nicer feeling as a freelancer than getting a job. And, you know, it really, it, it never, it never, you never tire of it. It's wonderful for someone to reach out to you and feel like you, you know, you might be useful to them in some way. It, it's truly wonderful and lovely and it lights up your day in a way that you probably don't realise, you know, as an art director, but being offered another job afterwards, like that, honestly, there's no finer moment. <laughs> like, I, I started welling up at that. 
I'm not even joking. I got a call a couple of weeks ago and I was just, I was proper like, <laughs> falling back to tears. Um, this, is, this is really contentious. Uh, I, you know, I, old penguin, I know I show a lot of old penguins, but um, I've just decided quite recently that I'm really bored of Jan Chickold's design genius. Like, he is undoubtedly a genius, but it's a kind of relentless... Uh, perfection that, that I find utterly interesting, you know, at least in, in, you know, at this point in my, in my life. Whereas the kind of non-designer design, it just, just, it's just so rich with, with, with interest and, and life and kind of everything's kind of a bit wonky. The penguin's about to fall over, the wrong types used. And, it, you know, when you see that stuff on mass, the overall kind of effect is so much warmer. It's such a, it's a bigger invitation in and, and it shows you the power of simple branding as well. The colour coding is enough. Everything else can kind of go to shit a little bit. And I think that when, when Jan Chico refined, restrained and um, rationalised it all, uh, really what you get is something that's just boring and a kind of blanket level and utterly unmemorable. And, um, and I think that as designers, I do it all the time. Like, you know, always looking to sort of round the edges of things and... and, and um, and purify, and, it, and it, 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 you can really wring the life out of stuff sometimes. Um, jumping to Dick Bruner, like, what I love about Dick's work um, is, it, it's kind of, I find it hard to talk about, but there's a direct connection between the marks made in the imagery and the lettering styles. That there's always, they always correspond in really, really direct ways, and they sit so harmoniously within a space. Um, you know, whether, whether he's kind of mimicking, uh, you know, the, the branches or the legs of the cat with the lettering style or, or just picking out the thickness of the hair there with the, with the thickness of the tight, that everything's just so, it works so harmoniously within such a small space. And these things can really be shrunk down to any size, expanded to any size. They're, they're a real simple but effective lesson in, in how we should do book design, I think. You know, in order to kind of like really strike through and like, connect to, to the eye. Just that connection between the thickness of the, the nib and the letter forms, it, it's a simple thing, but like it's so, it has such a devastatingly brilliant effect, uh, I, I think. Um, it always, always looks fresh, his work to me. Oh, this could be a contentious one. Um, <laughs> if, you know, <laughs> I don't know. Um, <clears throat> not all work can be challenging, not all work can be familiar and reassuring, of course, but I think as designers, especially freelance designers, if you, you, know, if you need to pay the mortgage, you, I think you need to decide what sort of chances you've got of having an approval. And I think, you know, <laughs> from certain experience I've had, um, if you go for something that you feel has never been seen before, there's a really, really good chance that it will, it will get shot to pieces. And, you know, you can carry on on that road if you want, um, but it might end in, in uh, you being kicked out of you know, your house. Um, but then on the other, <laughs> at the, at the other end of the spectrum, I, I do worry that, you know, once you get, if you get into a habit of, of getting those easy approvals, maybe that becomes a kind of intoxication and you stop sort of searching. And I suppose what I'm trying to say is, well, you know, if it is so hard to do things that feel fresh and challenging and they ask new questions, you know, why, why, why do it at all? You know, if it's like throwing work into a fire, like why, why would you even try? And I, I suppose the answer is simply that it moves humankind forwards and it, it's, it feeds the soul, it nourishes the soul. Um, anyway, uh, <laughs> so there's um, right, Gallimard editions, uh, talking about an easy kind of like duplicated aesthetic. These are really revered in France. And um, I would argue that the older covers are much more elegant, you know, these kind of, these, these white uh, Puritan editions that they have. But what's really strange about the more modern versions is, is that they've kind of wrapped these massive belly bands around them, uh, which, which duplicate cover content, which works so, it really seems to cut against this kind of idea of, this very elegant, spare, well-mannered type. You know, it's like, just have a cover. It's don't, you know, I don't really understand this logic. It's like this strange fight that's going on. Um, or maybe it's the answer. You know, maybe this is what we should be put, uh, putting for. It's like, put all the dross on the, on the band, and then you can have this incredibly dainty type underneath. Um, and you can kind of decide 
Anyway, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, these are very half-formed thoughts, aren't they? <laughs> um, uh, so chances of special... Here's another, here's another one for you. So, yeah, an unknown author is, is likely to get less special finishes. I, think, I don't think there's any kind of debate about that. But, of course, you know, the, the one that probably needs the, uh, the push is, is the, uh, the unknown author. The big-name author probably... You could probably print their cover on toilet paper and it would, would, would sell a certain amount of copies. I feel like there's a, a certain sort of betrayal there <laughs> that's going on. Um, this is... Um, I'm sure a lot of you have had this situation that work in this industry where, you know, you, you'll see all of a sudden you, you, you'll have worked on a cover. So that's mine on, on the right. And almost at the same time, there'll be a US edition that's being created. And, um, you, know, it, you know, they'll come out almost at the same time. And I think when I first saw this one, I was really struck. Like, I really rate Eric Carter as, as a designer, by the way. He's a great thinker, great writer. And I, I think he's a, he's a very thoughtful designer. I really admire the way he considers his work. And um, it, when I first saw this, I was really struck by... Like, talking about music, like, it, there is real music in this, in this design. There's a lightness of touch that I absolutely did hear uh, in the book when I read the book. But I, I focus on a very different part of it. You know, there was a kind of... There was a depth and a weight to, to the book as well. Like, it did both things. And it really, it really struck me when I saw its cover that, that how right it was. And up until that point, I thought my cover was the only cover, you know. And, and what was most fascinating was that Sylvia was, was um, speaking to both of us at exactly the same time. And she was okay with this very different approach, which is sort of extraordinary, isn't it? And, and remarkable. You know, if you think an author has spent the best part of a year or two, well, it could be a lot longer, writing a, a, a book of, you know, in this case, poetry, and... and being okay with such a swing, such a pivot, and that just really, really, really struck me. I, I don't know what point I'm making there either. Um, uh, this is probably a bit, a bit cliched. A uh, number of iterations required to achieve a simple looking cover. As a designer, you, you, you know that, it, that this happens. It really it, it has to happen for something to look right and have, you know. But it, of course, the publisher's inclination to make changes to that cover is incredibly uh, dialed up. Um, it, you know, always will be forever. Um, shall I stop? Is it, is it a couple of minutes? I'm so sorry, I've judged this all at all. Uh, this is an old, an old favourite as well. You know, the, you know, what do you show as a cover designer? Um, I just think this cover on the right is particularly good for, for leaving most of it to our, our imagination. And um, I just think it does a wonderful job through the kink in that finger of just of just communicating what Dracula has in store, his cruel intentions. And weirdly, when you see his face, all of that, the fear factor just goes away. <laughs> and then fingernails as well. Um, but, it, you know, it's, you, you can't really tire of reminding yourself of this, I think. And it's it, all of the emotive power, you know, in our brains, like, it's kind of it's charged by this cover. Um, and, and the other one, just nothing happens. You hit a wall. Your brain stops thinking. It stops act it, it's not activated. Oh, OK. <laughs> uh, I think it's probably a British thing. The, the, sh the shame that kicks in when uh, posting about your work, for me, it's around the, probably a bit before two posts, actually. I feel like we're allowed one post. And then you, and then you feel like you're really stinking the room out if you go beyond that. Um, talking of social media, yeah, um, so this, this is actually a publisher I work for, so I'm hoping they're not watching this, but this is really annoying to me. You know, this is a book cover that they're trying to show in a way that will help sales, but they've, it, they've created this camouflage effect. They've kind of they've doubled down on the, on, on the cover visual, so it's a thing on a thing, and, and it becomes utterly meaningless. If it just elevates the T, actually. Um, <laughs> This happens all the time. It's really mindless. And, and uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, that's just the one I grabbed today. But, uh, um, the amount of stuff you view, your, your inclination to do. I, I think this might change with age. Um, I, th I feel like when you're younger, you, you know, you kind of like really absorb things. You look at lots of things and, and you want to kind of get in and use those uh, things and, and, and break them apart and, and rework and reinvent them. And I think this probably... A, a, a time in your life where you know you feel like you almost have seen a bit too much, and it it, it does almost start to work against you. Um, I'm really not being, I'm not 
well, you we'll get much work after this. <laughs> um, uh, it's this kind of idea that you, 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 you know, you keep trying to start an approach and you think, oh, I can't do that because of that. Or I can't, can't go in that direction because of that thing that I've seen. And it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting moment, I think. It's just something I've been thinking about a lot lately. And I think it's, it's probably to do with the way we, we consume visual material. It probably does become a bit overwhelming and, you know, it's bits all the time. It's little bits and pieces. And that probably, that's, anyway. <laughs> um, last thing now, and then I'll, I'll shut up. Um, so this was a lovely interaction I had a couple of years ago, which uh, did come through, you know, work, working online. And over the years, you know, I think like most of you, you know, you tend to drag images, you know, from here, there, and everywhere, things that inspire you. You put them in a folder. You may or may not look at them again. This was one of those images that I always check back in with. It always leapt out at me when I was kind of scrolling around having an idle look uh, in f random folders. And it, it's, it's just got this really, really nice mix of, um, you know, this kind of elegant curly cue, but suggested in a way that's really rough and inky and smudgy. I just love those two things smashing together. You know, it feels quite disrespectful. It's got, it's got a kind of, it's got a charge to it and an unruliness to it. Um, I reached out to the designer when I was working on a cover a couple of years ago and said, could, this, I love this, this mark you've made. You know, could I commission you for, for a cover? Um, he said, it's actually not, I didn't do it. It was my, my son, um, Felix. And uh, I said, oh, well, uh, can I talk to Felix then, please, and maybe commission him? And, and uh, I went through uh, Christoph, um, Felix's dad, because uh, Felix only speaks German, and um, he, his answer was so lovely. It was, um, I did this when I was eight, and now I'm ten, and I don't trust myself to make the same, the same mark again. Um, but then, and I, but, but it was tricky because it was so right. I, um, we, we sort of scratched around a bit and agreed that I would try and emulate his, um, his eight-year-old hand um, by, by, by taking those lines and kind of working with them, duplicating them, you know, doing all of those terribly contrived things that we do, um, but then bouncing them back to him uh, and checking that he was happy. So 10-year-old Felix Kerbalin became the art director and I, and I was <laughs> emulating his hand. And it was such a lovely, lovely exchange and, and we're still in touch now because he's, I think I've, I think I've screwed him by getting him interested in the, in the industry. Um, <laughs> But, uh, but um, it, it, anyway, that's probably good enough time to do. Uh, thank you for listening to that and shambling down. Thank you very much, David. Um, I'd like to say a huge thank you to all this evening's speakers. You were all fantastic. Um, we're going to go around the corner to the old bell, to the pub. Please buy every speaker who drinks a drink if you uh, have the inclination. Um, huge thank you to Becky Chilcott as well, because without her, none of this would be... <laughs> also, very importantly, there are some incredibly worryingly talented students from Norwich University of the Arts here this evening. Uh, I went to see them a few months ago and I got really concerned, existentially concerned about my future doing this job. <laughs> Chat to them, uh, work with them, like they're absolutely brilliant. They're gonna come around the corner to the pub, I think. So make sure you give those guys uh, a bit of your time if you can. And a huge thanks to Jack, Nico and Kira again. Like you undersell yourselves so much for how much work you've done. It's been brilliant. So huge round of applause then. Yeah. Huge round of applause.